Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker Christopher Berry. You probably know him as Big Chris. Unsurprisingly, Chris is known for his big, beefy choppers. He was, after all, a top blade sports competitor. But when you look closer, you will see many very thin and light knives for camp and field, fishing and hunting, and even everyday carry. Another claim to fame, Chris competed on the beloved in my household, Forged in Fire spinoff, Knife or Death. How do you go from making massive, heavy choppers to utility blades that are as light and thin as they come? Uh, I would imagine lots of practice plays into it. Uh, and we're going to find out here with Big Chris in just a moment. But first, please like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and uh, let us know what you think of the show. Download us uh, wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't have to be tethered to the old uh, YouTube. And then join us on Patreon where you get all sorts of extra knife content and perks. Check it all out at thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. Hey, Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Oh, it's good to have you. Uh, so right before we started rolling, we were chatting and uh, I, I was starting to ask you a question that uh, I just want everyone to hear, especially my dad, uh, because uh, this is something that I've talked to him about a little bit and then never have gotten into. But you're the guy to talk to it about. What in the world are Blade Sports? Blade Sports is a uh, organization that focuses on the use of a knife as a tool. It's a cutting instrument, a tool. It's not for fighting. It's not for stabbing. And that's why they are the cleaver shaped that we have. Uh, so this is, this is my knife that I use for the, what was it? I guess it was the 18 and 19 season before, uh, COVID shut everything down. But this is Audrey. Uh, you notice there's no tip. It's a cleaver shaped. It's a couple reasons for that. You want the forward mass for chopping. When you're going through those two by fours, that extra mass that's out here where you don't have a point gives you a lot more cutting power back here. And uh, that's the first thing you want. The other thing is, you know, we don't have any stabbing events, so you don't need a point for stabbing. And, uh, man, these are, I tell people that these are like the top fuel dragster of the knife world. It's, it's mm -hmm. built for one thing, and that's going through those knife courses really fast, really efficient. Uh, but it's, they're thick and heavy. This one is uh, 420 thou thick, so almost 7 sixteenths. Wow. And uh, it's about 28 and a half ounces, but it's, it's ground zero thin. I mean, the, the edge is, I can guarantee it's thinner than the folder it's in your pocket. Wow. Uh, you know, I can get through a two by four and three hits with this knife, but at the same time, you could, uh, you could shave hair off your arm, slice newsprint. I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous how sharp these knives are, but at the same time, how much... I hate to say it, but damage and destruction they can do. Sure. Just well, uh, go ahead. No, no, please. Just the the chopping power that's there, but you still got out here on the tip. You still got speed and finesse for uh, slicing a piece of paper, slicing a a one inch rope, uh, cutting a straw, and doing those uh, snap cuts that we do. So it, there's a lot of versatility in this knife, but again, it's they're pretty thick and heavy and they're not the best when it comes to like camp knife style chopping. They, uh, they tend to wedge. You don't get a really good bite if you're cutting something big around. Uh, it's, it's really odd how that works, but I've, I've played with them as camp knives and it's fun to chop stuff, but a thinner like quarter inch version, would, I mean, would blow it away in my opinion in the camp knife rail. That's uh, really counterintuitive to me. Uh, then again, I'm not a, a big camper, uh, but it would seem like that sort of axe like geometry uh, would be handy in the camp. But I see what you mean, especially considering it's so sharp. It doesn't have the edge geometry of an axe, just the main bevel sort of. 
Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're just chopping like two inch branches, you know, something yay big around, you can zing through those in one hit all day long. But when you get into something a little bit heavier, like say you're you know a four or five inch tree, uh, something like that, it it doesn't get real good penetration. It kind of goes you know half two thirds of the depth of the blade, and then it just kind of squeezes back out. Yeah, I got you. Uh, it's it's odd. Yeah, you would think with that weight and the mass and how good it cuts and other events that it would do better it just in my experience it doesn't well paint the picture for us uh what is it like uh what is a um a knife sports event like and what are the um what are the actual challenges uh usually we well almost always we'll start with a two by four or it's gotten to be a two by six because <laughs> the the top tier competitors are so close and so fast to a two by four we kind of had to open it up to a two by six just to try and break that field apart a little bit. Uh, and, you know, cutting through a two by six, cutting through a two by four can be tough till you figure out the techniques and everything that goes to it. And then you add a two by six. It's a whole different world. Uh, but we'll start off with a two by four, two by six. Then we'll go to uh, usually a finesse cut. So you want to do something really uh, like a power cut and then go to a finesse cut because you get that adrenaline pumping. So then you have to slow yourself down and regain your dexterity to do the light, light cut, like uh, slicing a rope. We'll have a piece of rope laying on the uh, laying on the bench, and we'll have a tape mark in the middle. So you'll do a slice on one side of the tape and a slice on the other side of the tape, and then you want to chop through the tape. Well, all without the tape rolling off the rolling off the mm -hmm. bench. And, you know, getting all that stuff to come together and stay on the table, that's, that's tricky. I can, I can slice the rope pretty good, but seven out of ten times my rope will roll off the table. Uh, I'm just, I'm lucky that way, I guess you can say. <laughs> uh, then we'll move to rope cuts. You know, we cut three different size ropes, a one-inch rope, an inch and a half rope, and a two-inch rope. The, uh, you know, the two-inch rope's about a... That's probably about a three inch diameter. Mm -hmm. uh, the inch and a half ropes around two inches, probably. Uh, then uh, we'll go into like straw cuts. We'll take a flexi straw with the little accordion in the middle, and you have to cut a full ring off above the accordion. What? So yeah, so you know you've got you got say seven eight inches of straw sticking out, and the top two inches is your cut zone above that little accordion. Right. Okay. And so then you want to cut a full ring off. So you have a full ring above and a full ring below <laughs> without cutting into the accordion. Right. And cutting the straws is almost every competitor will tell you that's the hardest event. It's the most consistently inconsistent cut. So you could practice 150 straws before you go to a competition. And if you've got two straws lined up, more than likely you're going to miss one of them. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really it's really hard. It's it's kind of odd that way. Uh, then we have grapes sometimes, where you cut through a grape, and usually the grape's sitting on top of a golf tee. So you got <laughs> the grape on top of a golf tee, and you want to cut a slice off of the grape without uh, breaking the tee. You can knock the grape off the tee but you don't want to break the tea. Uh, then we have, we'll do cans sometimes, either like two cans on top of one another, and you go either go vertically all the way through or cut the top can, then cut the bottom can. Or sometimes we'll do a pyramid, like a one, two, and a three cans, and you got to cut the first can, then cut the second two cans, and then cut the three cans without all of them falling off the table. Uh and there's techniques to all this stuff, all these cuts. I mean, they I'm not saying they're not difficult, but when you learn the techniques of like an upward swing so that you're lifting it off the other cans as you cut it, it makes it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, but still, speed and edge geometry and sharpness and all that goes together to make uh, make it a successful cut. How, uh, how does how does one get involved in in this? Uh, how, well, how did you get involved in this? <laughs> I'd known about it for a while, and uh, me and Donovan Phillips, who's the chairman, the director of Blade Sports, 
uh, he'd been talking to me for a while, trying to get me involved. And at the time, there weren't any schools close to me. Uh, you had Waxahachie, Texas, and uh, that was about it at the time. And he happened to come to Louisville one weekend. And he was like, hey, can I come over and spend some time with you? And we got to talking, and he said, I've got a school coming up in Tennessee. How about you join? And I was like, yeah, I'm in. I've, I've wanted to do blade sports for a long time. So first thing he told me was just show up to the competition. Don't try and build a knife. I mean, you know, I'm a knife maker. That's what I do. <laughs> so I had to make a knife. And uh, sure enough, like he said, it. I mean, the knife cut, but it wasn't very good. It, it, it could use a lot of refinement. So uh, I went there in Tennessee. I did the school and uh, my first cut and just showing up and doing the school, taking the training to learn the safety and uh, some of the techniques for some of the cuts. That's that's the first part of getting in. It's just kind of showing up. Uh, eager to learn, eager to listen, and, you know, not doing dumb stuff with a knife. So go through that. That gets you in. I cut that first competition. And then two weeks later, there was another one up in Maryland at Scott Gossman's shop. So I took what I didn't like about that first knife, and I built the second knife to take to that one. And the second knife cut a whole lot better, still had some issues, so that was, uh, I think that fell about mid-March, and then you had Blade Show coming up 1st of June. So in that time between March and June, I did some practice. I built some tables and stuff so that I could practice. And uh, I basically, I didn't build a new knife, but I made some changes to that one. I reshaped the handle some. I reground the blade some. And uh, that made it cut a whole lot better, a whole lot better. What what were you <clears throat> what were you missing from that first knife that uh, you knew for that second competition? I have to do this and this. It was first off was the handle. The it's, Blade Sports taught me a lot about handle design. Um, if you have a handle that's too short, too where is it at? Too short this way mm -hmm. and too round. So you see this handle is kind of you know not real fat but real tall yeah. that keeps it from wanting to roll in your hand this way. So that keeps it locked in line with your arm. So that was the first thing I had to change with the second knife. And then it was just, it didn't have the cutting geometry that it could have. Uh, so I made that first knife out of 4V, which I was using a lot of 4V and other knives at the time. Nobody had made a competition knife out of 4V yet. So I was kind of the first one that, went into the, the CPM 4V. Now, there was a guy using Venetus 4 Extra, uh, Dan Keffler. He was using mm -hmm. Venetus 4. So, but I was the first to use 4V, and I just uh, I convex ground it because we thought, you know, axe grind, convex grind, that was that was the route to go. And, you know, it was it was ground good, but it just wasn't as thin as it could be. So the second knife I ground a little bit thinner, but still, it wasn't as thin as it could be. And the third knife, I went a whole lot thinner still with a, a convex to flat uh, kind of hybrid geometry. And uh, I was down around, it was under 20 thou, a 16th back from the edge. Wow. Okay. So it's, it's flat ground and then zero convex. So you don't really have a shoulder you can measure. So I measured it a 16th back from the edge. And I was, I was pushing around 18, 19 thou. So it was wow. just under 20 thou at that point. And, you know, that's where I started learning that this geometry will hold up. This cuts really good. And, uh, this knife is a little bit thinner than that, uh, edge, you know, at that same edge thickness. But so, but for this kind of competition knife, no matter how uh, how thin you bring it down at the edge, you still have to have that super uh, thick spine, right? Because for you, the weight, but also exactly. the shearing power, or for the mainly for the weight, uh, you could do the cuts with a quarter inch thick knife. Uh, you're just because you're lacking that mass, you're not going to be getting through the two by fours as quick. Uh, you're going to have to work really hard to get through that two inch rope. Uh, that two inch rope is a real 
I don't want to call it a test of your manhood, but it's kind of a test of your knife. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you don't hit that two inch rope good, it'll stop you dead and it'll feel like you just punched a brick wall because oh. all that shock runs up through your arm. And yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's rough when you don't make that two inch rope. You really, really feel that. I would imagine oh. you're driving your, your, everything into it, your whole oh, yeah. body, your whole it's, weight twisting and everything. Full body follow through and all, all in that, you still have a target zone that you have to hit. So if you cut outside of that target zone, it's a no cut. Even if you make it, mm. you don't get points for it. So that's that's kind of disheartening in itself, too. How did it how did it come to pass that you were on Knife for Death? Now, for those who don't know, Knife for Death was a uh, uh, blade sports competition, a reality show that was a spinoff, uh, if you will, of of uh, Forged in Fire. And uh, man, it was a great show. It was this. Uh, really high production competition with some pretty crazy challenges. Yeah. Uh, how, how did you get into that? And, and what was the, uh, what was the experience like? The, the experience was awesome. It was really awesome. But uh, it was the weekend when I was heading to the cut of my video that went viral. The one that I'm sure every knife enthusiast has seen at least a dozen times. Uh, so we were going to that cut. Uh, I got an email from a casting producer wanting to know if I was interested. So we emailed her back uh, while we were driving to Tennessee for that cut and I actually got a response. I don't know if it was the same day or not, but uh, we got a response and we went through the whole, whole thing getting lined up and right at the end, see my wife was supposed to go on the show also a different episode, but go on. And right at the end, History Channel said, no, we don't want a husband and wife on there because if there's, if one of us happened to win, they say there was some collusion or whatever, you know, whoever was on first is going to tell the other one how to mm. cheat the system to win, you know, but there wasn't no cheating that system. It was, a lot of it was left up to just your, how you respond to the different challenges. Uh, but, uh. Man, it was it was awesome getting to meet Goldberg and just some of the weird stuff that they decided to cut that I never really thought to cut before. And uh, one of the odd things, the uh, guy that designed the whole cutting set, he told me that, man, I bet I've watched your video a thousand times trying to get ideas on what we can, what we can't cut and how to set this whole thing up. So I, I was I was pretty tickled about that that he actually uh, watched my video figuring out what they wanted to do. That's that's pretty cool. I mean that's right there the highest form of uh, um, you know uh, compliment giving. Um, yeah. Crazy uh, obstacles on that. Um, my favorite was always the fish cut and also the one where it rained down um, melons and you had to water melons, had to yeah. cut them. Yeah. Very, very cool show. Well, so. the weird thing, they told us no upswings on cutting those watermelons. Hmm. So it, it never crossed my mind to even hold the knife to my side and angular up because they said no upswings. So I just took it as you've got to swing straight across and try and, you know, catch it. And my timing was way off and that was that. But, uh, you know, it was a great experience. I I say a lot of positive, good stuff about the time we had down there. But at the same time, I really feel that uh, kind of Goldberg was the detriment to the show in a way. Uh, I know he was a character and I know they were trying to pull like his wrestling fans in and stuff to watch the show. But I feel like somebody that knew about knives, like if you put Travis Wirtz, yeah. in the Goldberg position. Somebody that actually mm -hmm. knows and understands knives, I think that show could have went a totally different direction. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I always liked uh, Two Lamb because he obviously knew what he was talking about. He he knew uh, from the defense, self-defense side, right, and right. That, that was interesting. That gave a good spin on it. Uh, but I just, you know, that's my opinion on the show. Uh, I know a lot of people, I've told a lot of people that, and there's a lot of people that don't agree with me, but uh, I feel well, that... There was so much money spent on him that they couldn't 
do other things. Yeah, yeah. There was a there was a bit of a a a, a, a real rah rah vibe from him, which is cool. You know, uh, you know, s- some people are are very, but you know, just not my. It, it seemed a little out of place now that you mention it, but uh, I was there to watch the guys like you like chopping fish in half oh, and yeah. stuff. So, well, let's back way up then. How did you okay. get started in, in making knives? Uh, have you always been uh, a big Chris, the knife guy? I've, I've always been into knives and I started, I started getting into higher end folders uh, before I started making. But when I, when I say higher end, I'm talking like going from a Kershaw to a, a nice bench mate. Mm-hmm. you know, a really nice blue class bench mate or something. Um, but then I started getting into straight razors and, uh, you know, this was before I had kids, obviously before I had a beard and, uh, I was getting into straight razors and shaving with straight razors. So I wanted to make a straight razor and I started making a straight razor and, you know, I kind of decided I didn't want to go that route. I'd ordered a, I bought a couple custom knives at uh, the Guild Show when it was held here in Louisville. And I wanted a forged knife, so uh, I bought a forged knife from an ABS guy, and I got it. I brought it home, and it was deer season, and I got some deer meat. I was cutting it up, and just the knife wouldn't hold an edge. So I sent it back to the maker. He said he'll reheat treat it. I got it back. It was the same thing. And steel, he said, was 5160. So that kind of put a really sour taste in my mouth for 5160. And uh, since then, I've never touched a knife, used a knife or anything. It was 5160. So then I bought another custom knife from another guy off of Blade Forums. And it had a really good heat treat, would hold a really good edge, but it was ground really thick, really heavy at the edge. And, uh, I had a little one by 42 at the time that I was using to do some knife sharpening. And I thought, let me try and regrind this a little bit. So I reground it and I made it cut a lot better. And I'm like, well, why don't I just try and make a knife? So I took that blank that I'd started with that straight razor and turned it into like, uh, it was about a four and a half, five inch blade, you know, just woods knife. I wouldn't really call it a hunter or anything, but it was just a woods knife. And I loved it. And then some guys I worked with liked it at the time. So I ended up making about a dozen more of that same pattern for a bunch of guys that I worked with. And it just kind of blossomed and grew from there. Then I, I got turned on to super steels, uh, you know, blade sports. Since I was a fan of blade sports, all those guys using M4, the first super steel I used was M4 and it was awesome. I loved it. I made several knives out of M4, uh, sold a few like on blade forms and stuff, kept a couple and uh, just, I loved it. So, and it just, it just grew from there. Then I got into, I think the next steel I used was S90 V and uh, you know, I wore that little one by 42 out. It got to the point where it wouldn't even track because it, it didn't even have bearings. They were bronze bushings. Oh, wow. So the shaft that it ran on had wore the bronze bushings to the part where it wouldn't even track anymore. So then I upgraded to a Craftsman 2x42, which is an awful, awful grinder. Nobody should yes. ever try and make knives on those. Yes, yes I, I have one in my shed that I occasionally <laughs> pull out and try and make a knife with. So it, it, just, it just runs too fast. And that's the problem. And it... One thing I learned off that grinder, though, was how to be really gentle when I touched to the platen. You know, because if you were off angle or got in there too fast, you would gouge the blade. So I I did. It did teach me some good techniques for when I moved on to uh, next was a grizzly. And I made a bunch of knives on that grizzly. I still use that grizzly. For practically every knife I make, it's run around that grizzly. I use the the extended shaft side with a deburring wheel to deburr everything. Sometimes I'll put a wire wheel on it to clean stuff. I'll use it for buffing if I need to buff some acrylic handles and stuff. But uh, I got rid of that, and I bought a, a baiter. And the baiter was a really good upgrade. 
uh, variable speed, two by 72, two horsepower. I mean, it was, it was a nice machine, but again, um, I wore out, wore it out. All the tracking wheels and all the wheels wore out on it, which is a known little did I know at the time, but it's a known issue with the Bader that the okay. tracking wheels and everything will wear out. So I saved up, uh, I'd had pipe dreams for a TW 90 for several years. And finally I saved up to where I could buy that TW 90 and whew, you talk about a game changer. I could, I could do in a day on that TW 90, what would take me a week to do on that Vader. Wow. It's, so that's Travis, Travis Wirtz. That's Travis Wirtz uh, machine. Okay. And I still use it. I've, I've had it for four, I guess about four years now. And, uh, man, that thing's a workhorse. Uh, use it, run it hard, put it up wet, and it just starts up going again the next day. It, it, it doesn't care. So it's it's been a great machine. Uh, still into the super steels. Uh, I don't I don't hardly touch an oil hardening steel anymore. Uh, if I want to prototype something, a lot of times I'll prototype it in like O one. If I'm not real sure about the design and everything, because uh, I am a big fan of O one. That's what I I used it a lot in tool and die while mm -hmm. I was a machinist, so I knew how to heat treat it. I used it a lot when I first started making, you know, those first 20, 30, 40 knives that I made were all O1. one. And, uh, so I still have quite a bit of O1 one sitting around here. If I need to. Is the O1 one just easier uh, to work with? Uh, therefore it's kind of a, a good way to be quick and, and figure out. Yeah. Oh yeah. Doing. It's, it's, it grinds so much easier than, uh, the, uh, super steels, especially in a nailed state. And even when it's hard, I mean, even when it's 60, 61 Rockwell, a good ceramic belt will eat it away quicker than, you know, annealed uh, S90V or M4 or one of those. It, it just, it's the old steel, you know, I don't want to call it outdated, but it's, it's just old. It's been around for a long mm -hmm. time. It's simple. Uh, but it works good for a knife. It makes a fine knife. It's just, it's not what I'm into anymore. Uh, I predominantly stick to 3V, 4V, and the new Magna Cut. So, so I'm, what do you, I'm what do you think of the new Magna those. Cut? Man, it's, it's, it's the game changer. It is the cat's meow, in my opinion. It's got all the qualities of 4V, but it's stainless, which makes it even better. And I... I made this, uh, this is my camp fighter pattern. And I made this from one of the pieces of the first melt that they sent me for the testing. And I was doing some chopping and cutting and, you know, wedging and twisting and doing things with it. And I ground it. It's pretty thin. It's flat with a convex edge. And, uh, I wrote Laren one day, I said, I'm doing things with this knife and the edge isn't wrinkling than that, that four V would be. So it was, wow. I, I was really, I mean, I was chopping into two by fours and wedging out and scraping across knots when I was in the chopping and it just, I wasn't getting any edge deflection. And I told him, I said, this is, it's stellar. I just, it's great. So you were one of his, uh, one of the first people to get that steel. Yes. Um, how did that uh, come to pass? And and do you think it had anything, or did it have anything to do with your specific uh, angle on knives? I I have to assume that it did. Uh, I feel like I I tend to push the edge geometry thin and push the hardness <clears throat> high, and uh, especially using. The thinner steels, you know, the mm -hmm. 110 thick, the 70 thou, you know, 16th stuff. Uh, I don't know of a lot of other knife makers that are working in that same thickness ranges a whole lot, doing some of the bigger knives like I will. So I, I kind of feel like that was part of my, what made me different was working with the high hardness, the thin edge geometry and the thin steels all at the same time. Uh, and I had a pretty good relationship with, uh, Niagara, Bob and Frank and all them up there. You know, I've 
talked to them for years at Blade Show. Uh, when I would have an issue with heat treating or something, I would always give them a call and get some help through. So I had a pretty good relationship with Niagara also, and that, that probably didn't hurt the fact that I was uh, one of the first to get it. So this geometry that you're uh, fond of using, very, very thin uh, and overall light, but super stout and sturdy. Um, what were you going for when you, <laughs> I mean, I, I know it's uh you were going for a great cutting performance, but you're also coming from this very wedge like uh, place with the competition knives and then the, the more fishing hunting field knives I've checked out are so much different. How, how did you get from there to there? Um, I try to be very uh, keen on ergonomics, uh, blade shapes that are usable, um, and keeping the knife light. If a knife is light and unobtrusive, you're going to carry it and you're going to use it. And if it's not super refined, so I, I don't do hand rub finishes because I want the knife to get carried. I want it to be used, you know. No knife maker wants to hear of his knife being stuck on a shelf on display only. Mm. You know, even even the guys that make $5,000 Bowies and stuff. I mean, they want it to be used. They know it's not going to be, but they want it to be used. It's made to be used. And I just, I took a little bit different approach to that by not finishing as nice. Uh, really keen on handle ergonomics, you know, making sure when you... Uh, like these, when you put it in your hand and it, I mean, it just, it just fits. And then when you roll it around and it curves that fit into your hand right there, so you can work it upside down, getting up inside the belly of a deer or a pig or whatever you're doing. But if it's, if it's light and it's comfortable and it holds an edge and it cuts better than anything you've had before, you're more than likely going to carry this more than yeah. something that, doesn't perform as well and that's that's kind of my driving mentality with knives and when i when i design a new handle i'll hold it and i'll play with it and then i'll take it to my wife and i'll have her hold it and her play with it and tell me where's the hot spots for her at even though her hand is a lot smaller not every guy using a knife is six four four hundred pounds right you know so I, I really try and make sure it fits a lot of different people. And that's, that's kind of my way of doing that. So if she tells me she's getting a hot spot at a certain spot, I'll, I'll look at it and be like, Hey, you know, I can, I can take a little more off of here. Or if I add a little bit more, it'll put the pressure in a different spot in your hand. And you know, that's, that's kind of my mentality with designing a handle, making, making sure it fits me, making sure it fits her and going from there what about the overall design of a knife uh, when jim had your instagram feed up there before <clears throat> there were two knives there that just i mean i see them and i go uh, uh, they're saxes the sax the red handled sax with the red sheath and then there was yeah. a tan one a tan handled one or i'm not sure if it was the same knife pre-dying uh or something but uh, you have that design, and then you have what looks like a double-edged or triple-edged Tanto in the upper right. I'm not sure if that's a Yeah, this, <laughs> that's the tactical spatula. Tactical uh, spatula. All right, so tell me about these designs, the the the, the less common ones like this. That, that tactical spatula, is, it's a joke. I personally cannot stand that knife. I don't like making them, but guys love them. I have so many people that love that knife. So I, I make it. And that was kind of the driving force for the, the new, the Geisha, this, this thing that we can Ooh. talk about in a minute that broke. But, uh, you know, a lot of people want a Tanto. I'm not a huge Tanto fan, but I, I like the looks of the differing grind angles with the grind down the spine, the different angle on the front and then the main grind and, you know, guys like it, and uh, they're kind of a pain to grind, kind of a pain to make, because you got all these different angles and lines that you want to be a certain way and to match and to meet. And uh, I think my wife even named it the tactical spatula. <laughs> so you know, and, you know, that's that's where it is. It, I mean, it's still got all the ergonomics, all the 
thin grind. It's still got everything going for it that makes it a big Chris. It's a it's a pretty but knife there, Chris. It's it's just different, and I, I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm I just not like a fan it. of it because yeah. I I'm not a big fan of the Tantos. But I'll tell you, this uh, when I broke this knife. And I made Bob, which we're going to call Bob because it's a happy little accident. <laughs> Just like me. <clears throat> when I made that, uh, I have totally fell in love with this knife. I mean, I've used it for cooking, chopping carrots, potatoes, onion stuff in the kitchen, breaking down boxes. Uh, is that is that front edge sharpened? Oh, yeah. This is, this is zero ground, oh, man. flat, with just a very little micro bevel. So, I mean, it's, it's killer sharp. And there's even a video on my Instagram a ways back of cutting paper with just the tip because I got a lot of questions about whether that front's sharp or not. But this is how that started off. Jeez. You know, it was supposed to be that long. And this broke off trying to temper. It just, it wouldn't get straight. And I kept clamping it with more and more. I mean, I had it, I had it pretty good angle you know something like that and then i walked away from the oven and i heard the ting mm. when i walked away and i i knew what happened and i was like please tell me that's not what just happened so but i went ahead and finished it up anyway i put some new carbon fiber on it that i got it's got a Ooh, some nice. it's got a white binder i don't know if you can see that very yeah. well but the binder in the uh, carbon fiber is white and it will age kind of like Westinghouse where it'll turn to a more rusty Brown as it ages. Uh, so that was new and I put all that together to make it new. Yeah. That picture. <laughs> uh, I used the, I used Bob and my 12 year old daughter used that little Nakiri and we cut up a big old mess of carrots for some uh, chicken noodle soup. Ooh, so good. that Nakiri is a uh, 16th thick O one. Also, you have a. I want to. I want to talk about this sax for a minute. I'm not sure if it's something you do regularly, uh, but um, uh, I think it's absolutely beautiful. If Jim scrolls, I'll tell him when when to stop. Um, but uh, is this a regular design of yours? And it's if not, why? <laughs> <laughs> it's the. The one that you see in here with the red, it's called Drunken Coffee Bag. It's a shade tree burlap scales. Oh, neat. Um, that's only the second one of those that I've ever made. You're that talking one, about Jim. this one right here? Yeah, yeah. right in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's only the second one I've made. Um, I have the pattern. It's just, I don't know why I don't make that many more. I just, I haven't. Uh, it is. It is pretty sweet. Uh, it it is. It's one of the best looking, uh, you know, modern saxes uh, that I've seen. You. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a it's a thin line between sax and clip point, you know. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes, uh, I, I just really like this uh, this execution, this design. You also have this pocket fighter from a few years back that I was looking yeah. at earlier today, and and I was just thinking about, you know, there's a a pretty broad diversity in your designs. It seems like. So are you a freewheeler? Do you just kind of wake up and say, today I'm making a boning knife, damn it, and just kind of do that? Or <laughs> how does that work? Yeah. Uh, sometimes I would just, I'll think of a design, think of a pattern, and I'll get my phone out and I'll pen sketch it. Just a really ugly, dirty sketch on my phone to kind of get the idea down. Then uh, I'll refine it on paper, make a pattern, and, you know, knock it out. And that's... That's kind of what came about with this Orca chef's knife. Oh, yes. Uh, this thing is cool. It was just something that kind of popped in my head. I said, you know, let's let's get that on paper. Let's get the design rolling. So then I, I did this one. Then I did a, it was about a 10-inch slicer, narrow blade slicer with the harpoon tip. Uh, then I did an 8-inch kind of more of a standard chef knife look in with the harpoon tip. I, I haven't finished one of those out yet, but they all kind of came out the same way. I wanted uh, something a little bit different in the chef knife line. And I was thinking about doing a whole harpoon tip line of chef's knives. So I've got, 
I've got a sketch over here of a six inch utility with the same general handle shape. Uh, and I've got a sketch of a paring knife, like a two and three quarter, three inch blade paring knife that's got the harpoon tip and everything to it. Just kind of make everything line up together. But, uh, but yeah, sometimes I get a wild hair and I mean, that, that's how the, that's how this came about too with, uh, wow. you know, the top grind and the front and, you know, I was, I look at this and I, I never thought about making a smaller version like the Bob came out, but, uh, I want to take this and stretch it out to about 20 inches and have a short sword. Oh yes. And, I think you, you should know, do keep, that kind of everything the same but just stretch it out you know about 10 more inches than that and I, that's that's kind of how i work and that's kind of how new patterns come about is just like you said like you said freestyling it uh my wife asked me a few weeks ago how i go about making a knife and i'm like i take away everything that don't look like a knife and spoken you know, like it, a sculptor man it makes perfect sense to me to say that, but she's just like, that is so out there. Well, so. I've, I've, I've heard that, uh, was similar. Uh, the similar response was given by Michelangelo when someone asked him how he carved the David out of, out of a block of marble. And he's like, I just got rid of everything that wasn't, you know, David, huh. okay. <laughs> you know, like, okay. so, so maybe that means you're some sort of a genius, um, <laughs> <laughs> a knife knife genius uh yeah like, you know that's not uh so what about the the business aspect of it you know i you you weren't born a knife maker presumably you got yeah. into this at some point how how did you and when did you decide to make a go at it uh when we had our second kid uh cost of daycare was redonkulous mm. and uh we knew something had to change. So my wife is a school teacher. So she had the retirement. She had, you know, the stable job, the 401k, she had everything going for her. Whereas I was just a machinist working, you know, I, I'd, I'd reach kind of the pinnacle of where I was going to make it in the company. I was working directly for the owners, the a father and a son. And I mean, I was, I was kind of their yes man. Whatever they needed, I would do. I mean, if they needed me to drive to Chicago or drive to Colorado or wherever I had to go and do work, I was going and doing work. And uh, when I had kids, I was starting to get tired of the traveling. I loved the traveling, but I wanted to be home with my kids. Yeah. So we kind of decided I was going to quit. And I started dabbling with the knife making. And uh, I was going to quit to be the stay-at-home dad, and I was going to make a knife or two as it was feasible for me. And, you know, I had a guy tell me that it takes, it took him about six years to develop a following to be able to sell knives. And I had, I got fairly popular on Blade Forums where I was, I was selling knives pretty quick, not having much of an issue. And, uh... Then Blade Sports started, and I started making and selling more choppers. And then the video went viral, and I couldn't make anything fast enough. Everything mm. that I made sold. And that's, that's kind of the situation I've been in for about the last two years, give or take a little. Uh, I was really worried about COVID when it started, that people were going to lose a job, people were going to stop wanting to buy knives, and so far, I haven't noticed that. Um, I'm still selling knives as fast as I can make them, typically. Uh, my wait list is about a year plus right now, give or take a little. Uh, and is that and for is that for every first of all congratulations i mean what a what an awesome uh, problem to have i just can't make them fast enough i mean that's yeah. but that that's amazing especially after two you know two years of it uh or two years at in this manner yeah, yeah. and uh um well congratulations about that that's that is definitely an accomplishment especially in a in a field like knives where it's not, you know, success doesn't necessarily mean you make lots of, lots of money. Um, but, uh, what, what interests me is how you take 
the passion of something like this as obscure as knives obscure to the to most of the world and then and then normalize it and turn it into something where people are like they're they're ready to buy your stuff they're ready to line up and buy your stuff uh, i i have a i have a passion for knives i really love what i do uh and i get asked a lot like how do you keep the drive how do you keep wanting to do it well Every now and then I have to stop and do something for me. Now, everything I typically, everything I make, I will sell. It's a very, very select few knives do I make with the intent to keep. Uh, typically, what I keep has a flaw somewhere. I put my maker stamp on upside down, which I don't do very often, but it's happened. Uh, I find a crack in the spine somewhere. You know, not in a critical part of the blade, but a crack in the spine. I'm just like... If there's a crack here, where might it be out there on the blade? So I'll, I'll hang on to that. Or like Bob and it broke, you know, and I'm worried, what if there's another stress fracture somewhere else and somebody's out using it and it breaks on them? You know, don't want that to happen. But typically I have to stop and take some time for me. Make something that is really exciting me, driving me, uh, like a chef's knife for um you know like the orca i was so tickled to death about that orca when i designed it i couldn't wait to get one of those made and i love it, it it's uh, i kind of think of it as it's really out of the box for a chef's knife but man it works the i feel like it's one of the best chef's knives i've ever made oh excuse me i feel like it's one of the best chef's knives that i've made to date just the tip is thin hold, hold it up again chris so we can see that sure and uh and if you're listening it is a beautiful uh chef's knife it's got it, it almost looks like a santoku up front and that it's yeah. rounded rounded but yeah. but it's got a more gradual pointy roundiness which i really like and then just a, a beautiful harpoon that terminates in in what i imagine is about as far forward as your thumb could stretch uh but it also yeah, looks uh, and, you know i made sure yes. that when you hold it the thumb don't get in the way when you pinch grip it, yeah. you know, it's it's out of the way. So you can rock it, roll it on a board, cut it's it. It's nice I and broad, too. You can scoop up all your ingredients oh yeah. with it. Oh, yeah. Now, and the hand, the handle on this one's a little bit wider than I normally do. And that, that kind of fell into the aesthetics, keeping everything uh, visually appealing, or at least visually appealing to my eyes. Uh, but I make sure there's enough height here so that if, you know, if you use the knife like this, your I mean, your knuckles out of the way. Right. Uh, and I, I, I try and take all of that stuff in account when I'm designing and working along with the actual performance, making sure it's ground thin, making sure that it's, let's see if I can balance it. So I, this is balanced just a little bit behind that termination you know, the front of the scales. Right. But when you're up here pinching it, I mean, you, your blade's really light at that point. So this is a 110 thou, 4V, wow. 63 Rockwell. And okay. uh, I ground it down. It was about eight thousandths before I sharpened. And then wow. I blended a convex up into the edge. So, I mean, it's... So it slips between the atoms, basically. Oh, it's it's wicked sharp. It's Man. wicked. And I, I, just, I had to do a video. I... I ended up getting COVID, uh, so I was out for about two weeks leading up to just the other day. Oh. So uh, I did an Instagram post about, you know, I've been out, but I still can sharpen a knife, and I took this and whipped through a whipped through an empty two-liter bottle pretty oh, nice empty. with it. empty. Sweet. And... Uh, so let, let me ask you this, Chris. Uh, if, if, you're an, if you're a year out on your on orders... Um, how do people, you know, I'm like sitting here looking at your knives. I've been looking at them all day, you know, in preparation to talk to you and, uh, I, I've developed some favorites and this, whatever, i maybe I've developed a taste and then seeing that orca, uh, it would fit in our kitchen ever so beautifully. How does someone, uh, get your stuff? If, is there a secondary market area you can suggest people kind of lurk? I don't know about a secondary market. I don't. I don't follow that. Uh, I haven't been on blade forums in about a year now. It just, the shop talk section got kind of 
snippy. I don't, I guess you could call them. There was a lot of Karens on there that wanted to argue. It didn't matter. If you said the sky was blue, they would argue you that it's red. And right. I just, if you were wearing your safety goggles, you would see that the sky is red. Yeah. And I just, I got tired of dealing with that. So I just exited away and, uh, you know, you can get stuff from me. There's, I'll put stuff up for sale that like I've been using. That was a test knife. Uh, some every now and then we'll do raffles through my Facebook page. Uh, I try and when I do a batch of four or five knives, I typically try and make one or two that aren't orders just for, for people like yourself that are wanting to get into a big Chris, uh, that way they can kind of slip in or if somebody down the line on an order has something that they want and that they can, they can get in. But I try and make one or two every couple of weeks that are just available for people to buy. Um, email and Instagram is the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, I, I do everything on Facebook, Big Chris Facebook also, but I despise Facebook Messenger. So I, I don't even look at that. I just some the way it works on my phone. I just can't stand how it works. Yeah. So I, I don't even mess with it. But so if you're interested in your Facebook group, you just uh, look up Big Chris Custom. Yeah, uh, email me, email okay. me, Instagram, comment on something. You know, I'll I'll catch it. If I don't catch it, my wife will catch it, and she'll say, "Hey, you've got a comment. You need to go check out." So she's pretty active on there too. Um, so let me ask you this. Well, where, where do you want to see Big Chris Knives in the future? How do you want to see this company grow? Uh, I want a laser. I want a laser to do engraving on blades and things of that nature. Uh, I would like to eventually get a CNC machine. Just if not for making the blades, for taking like a water jet blank and CNC in the handles and making the handles, you know, 10 or 15 thousandths bigger than this so that they're 3d machine. I glue them on and then I run around it with the grinder and it's a finished knife. Right. Uh, so that, and these are my first real bout at water jet. I'm getting 150 of this pattern cut and 150 of this pattern Ooh, cut nice. and both of them are 70 thou thick magna cut um so i'm looking forward to that uh i'm doing that to try and bring that price point down bring it down from about a 450 500 knife to somewhere in the 250 to 300 range uh nice so it's all it's 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 still your handwork and you're still making the knife. It's just uh, some of the mundane parts, like cutting out the blanks. Yes. And man, I hear you about the 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 handles. I could see how a knife maker, a fixed blade knife maker, especially, would want a CNC maker for, if nothing else, handles. I could see how handles could be mad oh, yeah. after a while. Oh yeah, and just you know that consistency. You know where you've got the same thing over and over. Yeah. You know you like that way that handle feels, and it's going to be the same on every one of them. So I, I like that. I like consistency. Uh, I would like to be able to move out of my garage at some point also and have an actual storefront, you know, whether it be a little mini warehouse mm -hmm. or an actual storefront, like on the main dragon town or something, I, I would like to uh, be able to do that also. And I also have aspirations for forging. I've got a, I've got a couple of monster anvils in the floor here behind me. And I would really like to be able to beat some hot steel on them one day. Oh, so that sounds great. I mean, that sounds like it would it would uh, it would complete the circle for you. You know, in terms of the blade sports, in terms of the knife making, and then mm -hmm. taking it all the way back. Forging really interests me from the maximization of material usage, where you can take a ball or take a small bar, just a small chunk of steel and move it this way and move it longer and make a full size knife out of just a rough bar yeah. and not have, you know, the big chunks right here that go in the scrap bin for, from sawing it out. That that's what interests me about forging. 
You know, it, it seems, well, you were talking about, uh, you remove everything that's not a knife, uh, which is a very, uh, uh, it's very sculptural instinct in that sort of removal, stock removal uh, idea. But the, the idea of taking something, uh, something very elemental, like a lump of steel and then putting it in hot fire and then moving it. Yeah. I mean, th it is, it is, uh, it is infinitely more romantic, um, you know, in way of making a knife, I gotta say, yes. uh, it, it, it might, it might not be as practical and, and, uh, you know, there, there might be other things about it that aren't, but, there's that magical alchemical sort of uh, process that happens that is has to be mystifying. I mean, I've witnessed other people forging knives, never done it myself. And just the witnessing of it, it seems yeah. like a solemn occasion. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 really interesting. I, I've got a love with hammers, too, and it drives my wife crazy. Oh, that yeah. You know, I don't forge, but yet I'm buying two and three hundred dollar forging hammers just because I'm like, hey, that's cute. <laughs> yeah, this way you won't have to buy it when you're ready to really start forging. It'll already right. be there, and it'll, exactly. it'll, it'll feel like a cheap thing, you know. And it's, I, I found that they actually work nicer as a hammer when they're when I'm using a hammer to stamp my logo in my blades. I'm using one of these forging hammers because it. They balance better. They hit harder. I mean, you take a two-pound forging hammer and a two-pound east wing, and that two-pound forging hammer actually hits harder than the two-pound east wing. I believe it. And, you know, it's and it feels nicer when you do it. And at the same time, you're like, you know, I bought this hammer, and I'm, I fed this guy's family for a night kind yeah. of situation. Yeah. You know, given given back to the to the makers, and that's another thing that I've really come to admire with making knives is it's given me a lot bigger appreciation for made in the U.S. You know, I'm looking for USA made this or that. I, I really try and support American companies and you know that kind of thing. And way American, more than I ever thought of before. Well, uh, and 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 there are so many small businesses, American small businesses, and it's never been harder for them um through circumstance and also through deliberate acts you know by government it's never been it's never been you know more difficult for small business uh small right. businesses and so to meet people like you and and others on this show you know is is a privilege because you're an example of someone who's making it work and it's not a it's not an easy road to hoe uh from just from what I've heard talking to people, let me ask you one last question before I let you go. And then for patrons, uh, we'll have, we'll have another 10 minute, uh, uh, chat on the other side, but, uh, I want to ask you this. I ask this of all, uh, fixed blade makers. Do you ever consider or entertain the idea of designing or making a folder? Oh yeah. We've designed quite a few folders. It's, uh, I got a little scrap piece of magnet cut I'm getting ready to cut off over here. And uh, I was telling my wife last night, I was like, I am going to take this scrap and make me a big uh, back pocket slip joint. You know, I've, I've got a love for the big slip joints. I like a big knife, yeah. but uh, like a four inch blade, you know, like that uh, big Remington uh, yeah. gun stock pattern, something like that. I've got a piece that's going to be a scrap that's big enough to do something like that. I was telling her, I said, I might finally just make that folder that I've been wanting to make for a long time. So that's yeah. great. And, and, a, and a back pocket is that's one of my favorite uh, patterns that the Tony Bowes back pocket. I think that's mm -hmm. so cool. Nice, big, beautiful clip point blade. I, I love looking at uh, Don Hansen and uh, Rick Menifee stuff, their folders they make. Don Hansen did a, it was a two blade trapper a couple of weeks ago that had a clip point and a worn cliff mm. and it was gorgeous way outside of my, what I could ever afford. I'm sure. But nonetheless, it was a beautiful knife. And I just like whew, one day, if I could have one of those, I'd be doing all right. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like I, I almost wish I could just rent knives like that. <laughs> and just like, yeah, man, I would love to have that knife for a week and, yeah. and have it and hold it and ooh and ah over it and then return it you know, and, yeah. and, and, and then be on my way with, uh, with $1,200 still in my pocket. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Well, hey, Chris, uh, I, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I, I, I really have uh, gravitated towards your knives. I love fixed blade knives. And and uh, in in this hobby, there seems to be, you know, a lot of people into folders and then others into fixed blades. I love them all. And yeah. uh, any opportunity to bounce back and forth, uh, I will take. And um, well, I, I really love that sax. And um, now my wife and I have to hunt down your episode of uh, <laughs> Knife or Death and and check it out. Episode so thanks four. a lot, man, for season coming on one, the show. Season one, episode four. Wait, wait, season one, episode season one, four. Season one, episode four. four. And then if you're a, uh, if you have Netflix, check out Southern Survival. Oh. Episode four on Southern Survival is uh, Cutting Tools, and I, I was on that as well. Oh, cool. All right. Southern Survival it is. Big Chris, it's a pleasure. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Talk to Thank you in you. a minute. All right. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Barry of Big Chris Knives. Uh, I, I don't know if you noticed this, but in the very beginning when he was talking about the competition chopper that he's used a lot to win these uh, competitions, uh, I think he called her Audrey. Uh, I can't remember. I'm going to have to ask him, but I think that's cool. I, I, I'm old school that way. You know, name your cars, name your rifles. Hell, name your competition knives. Uh, just name them after women. I, th I think it's appropriate, even if indeed you are a woman. Um, so, well, that's my two cents. Uh, you can check us out uh, next Sunday for another great interview. And then we have the Wednesday supplemental show. And then, as always, Thursday Night Knives uh, live at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, you come on, join a, join the conversation on your own device and uh, and be here as we start to do more giveaways. Uh, we do the monthly Patreon uh, Gentleman Junkie giveaway, but uh, we're going to start a more weekly, more regular knife giveaway. Just uh, so I can thin the herd and so you can benefit. All right. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, please, I beg of you, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.